Hello, everybody, and welcome to Pole Focus, the cinema-based entertainment podcast where a couple of freelancers come together to talk shop. My name is Mike, and as always, I'm joined by my brother in crime, a man who is known for his atomic wit and nuclear charm, a man so powerful he can bend the laws of the universe. He is the bomb, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Andrus. Okay, I'm just getting <laughs> um, You know... I, I, I feel pretty atomic today. I, you feeling I feel, pretty atomic? I feel, I feel bummy. I Good. Feel, you know, kind of cold and clammy and <laughs> you know, under the weather. No, no, no. Uh, no, no you way. know, the rainstorms, the thunder showers that we've been getting have been wonderful. Oh, so. yeah, sure, sure. It is, uh, quite, we're, quite getting, lovely. we're getting through kind of like a monsoon season. Uh, Light and, shows uh, being what they are. Man, so, it's... <laughs> Um, uh, this is, uh, definitely, uh, gosh, I always have like these, these small, uh, blocks of, of, uh, communication whenever we start one of these episodes, because it's one of these situations where like, you know, we, we write up what I'm going to write up. I have, you know, the different articles in front of me in regards to like the, the title that we're going to be talking about. Um, and when it comes to, uh, especially after because of work and scheduling and me being forgetful, uh, it's been some time. I think I feel like I see this say this every episode. It's been a while since we've talked with each other about a movie or something like that. But this time it's actually pretty true because uh, we mentioned uh, a little bit before we started recording that things are beginning to cool down, much like um, when it comes to the industry and everything. Much, much like, much like a a celestial body, a star may compress and maybe expand uh, the uh, production. <laughs> attitudes and uh, scheduling here in Utah is doing that. It is uh, constricting a little bit, but it is going to explode once more. Uh, but uh, it's just so very happy to, uh, you know, have you here, Andrus, uh, because it's a, oh, uh, it's it's a uh, it's a big bang. What the the <laughs> God stop me, please. Uh, it's a big bang. The uh, the title we're going to be talking about today, and uh, we will get to it eventually. But uh, it has been a while since you and I uh, spoke. Uh, you had some things going. Uh, uh, going through uh i am happy to say that uh we are recording uh towards the uh towards the end of august at this episode and as you guys know we record whenever we can we don't necessarily not necessarily the publishing order that we have the episodes and uh, i am taking the first vacation that i've had in a year and i'm currently on it and <laughs> i have the uh, great pleasure of uh of taking some time to record an episode here with you uh, you uh, have been dealing with production. Uh, you've been dealing with auditions, and uh, things are beginning to slow down. But you know that you can't take a break, which is always the story. How are you not slowing down? <laughs> not here. Not here. No. How are you? How's everything been? How are you? How are uh, you doing? Good. Bid, busy as busy as busy yeah. as busy. We're we're knocking some of our our. Uh, productions off of our list nice. because they've wrapped which is nice mm-hmm. um but yeah there's still plenty that we're working on and the ones that we're working on right now have like huge casts i'm glad to hear it i'm glad to hear it and stuff like that so um yeah and i get to play a little bit later in the month so i'm excited about that. congratulations congratulations thank you thank you and then uh yeah just uh tons of you know kids are already going back to school What's it's insane isn't it yeah what is up with that i don't remember school starting as early as as uh middle of august, august yeah me neither it was like you know a, a a hard like september uh uh beginning point for, uh, for for when we were kids around. whatever i think it's, it's like i think it's a it's one of those situations that kind of like speaks to my age too because now i'm i'm legitimately surprised that 2023 is over half half over I mean, even more right. so. And it just kind of like legitimately freaks me out. Not in, like a, a terrible way, like I'm getting a panic attack or anything, but like I'll get up in bed and I'm like, you know, start my routine. And I'm like, oh, what's the date? What? And like, I literally have like, you know, almost uh, an existential crisis <laughs> when, when I'm looking at my calendar and being like, oh an my existential God. Existential crisis is a daily occurrence for me. <laughs> I mean, once you can say 20 years ago, and then you have to count and then correct it to like 25 oh, 100%. Or years ago. 100%. Um, I mean, I, I, I feel like I'm really, really aged. Experienced. You're experienced. Don't uh... like, a, like a fine wine. Exactly. Or a exactly. That's, that's, that's been in a barrel for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, I, I went I went and saw a movie and and uh, at the theater I went with my brother 
he told uh, the concessions person that uh, I was born in the 40s. Oh, my God. Him. Yeah, yeah. The uh, scenario. I hate uh, I hate. I said I look scenario. really good for my age. Yes. <laughs> Dude, that, word of it. I gotta right. do that. I gotta do that too. Like if when I'm really like looking to get a compliment, I mean, I just gotta tell them like, "Hey, I'm actually 65." Uh, can oh, I get like you know the well, senior discount? In that discount? case, you look great. Yeah, exactly. You look great for 100 and, uh, 111. Beautiful. Um, look at you. You, what, look, you look amazing. See, what oh, are you doing? See, exactly. Oh, you know. Uh, you know I don't I, know why I'm going to that voice, but I'm going to the voice. You the entire great. the entire podcast. The entire podcast. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like a Seinfeld episode right now. I feel, <laughs> I'm feeling like I'm a mix between Jerry and George. It's a Seinfeld episode. The fact that we're not talking about we're talking about no, nothing I, I, at the moment. No, no, I, yeah. Kind of oh. spat that a little bit like Kramer, you know? I Dance think like I, I wonder what people are going to be because like that's what, that's what people are doing now, right? Like sitcoms that we grew up with that were like, you know, a normal thing that you would talk about at the, at the, ugh, the water cooler or whatever. People are, are talking as being like, you know, classic television uh, nowadays. And it's just, my God, I remember when I was in high school and that stuff was coming up in prime time and everything. It, it can be, I, it, it, it's one of these situations too, where I think like the title that we're talking about now, which is a, uh, an attempt uh, for Hollywood and a very capable director and team to capture a very uh, a pivotal point of our country's history that it gives me even more introspection because it gives us a chance to like look back. And even though it's a dramatized version, it gives us a chance to look back and see what the world was like and then see how much it's changed over the time since those uh, events that we're going to be speaking about and the subject matter of the film that we're going to be talking about come into play. Uh, one could say that even though politics and people may change, uh, the universe is eternal. Uh, we are going to be talking about Oppenheimer. This is a national emergency. Detonator's charged. in a race against the Nazis. And I know what it means if the Nazis have a bomb. They have a 12-month head start. 18. How could you possibly know that? We've got one hope. All America's industrial might and scientific innovation connected here. A secret laboratory. Keep everyone there until it's done. Let's go recruit some scientists. Build a town, build it fast. We don't let scientists bring their families. We'll never get the best. Why would we go to the middle of nowhere for who knows how long? Why? Why? How about because this is the most important thing to ever happen in the history of the world? You're the great improviser, but this... you can't do in your head. Are we saying there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world? Chances are near zero. Near zero. What do you want from theory alone? Zero would be nice. This is a matter of life and death. But I can perform this miracle. World War II would be over. Our boys would come home. That's happening, isn't it? The world will remember this day. Our work here will ensure a peace mankind has never seen. Until somebody builds a bigger one. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves. And the world is not prepared. to know what's next. Two. What's next? One. 
And that was the trailer for the latest Chris Nolan film uh, coming about uh, Oppenheimer uh, with uh, this uh, man. Whenever it comes to Nolan, and I hate to be like, you know, one of these guys that's going to go on these diatribes uh, when it comes to the issues, but also just the adoration I have for Christopher Nolan and his team. Uh, I want to apologize to everybody who's listening, who's listening uh, because I am definitely a fan. And uh, this whole conversation that we're going to have, though we're going to try to be honest and critical, it's important you guys know that uh, I can't speak for Robert, but uh, I am definitely biased when it comes to Christopher Nolan. I have seen nearly all of his films. I like nearly all of his films. And uh, when it comes to Oppenheimer, uh, we are dealing with uh, a subject that he has tackled before. Uh, but I think that the the expectation, given the kind of publications that came out about this movie when the trailers were first coming out, that kind of thing, kind of gave us a rope a dope because it was a subject matter that we're going to be speaking about in depth with uh, today's episode. And it kind of threw me for a loop that I enjoyed. Uh, but we are going to be speaking about this audio uh, autobiographical uh, dramatization of the story of... Uh, Mr. Robert Oppenheimer, who was an acclaimed scientist, physicist, and theoretical physics, uh, who was uh, born in April of 1904 in New York City and uh, passed away in 1967, but had a incredible uh, 62 years of scientific breakthroughs, breakdowns, and uh, just achievements when it came to, um, well, everything from capable educational foundations of uh, ideas about physics that changed our uh, capabilities as a country uh, to uh, what some people would think uh, the uh, capability of being able to commit mass genocide on a people uh, through the, uh, the the use of the atomic bomb uh, on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan during the end of World War II. Uh, it is a interesting piece. It is a piece that uh, doesn't pull many punches, and uh, I was surprised specifically that it is a piece that isn't about the bomb. Uh, it is about the man. And uh, given the initial trailers that were coming about when uh, we first started getting, you know, ideas that uh, this film was going to be uh, published, uh, I think trailers started sometime back in like twenty. 21 actually uh roughly uh, when things were first going through maybe a little bit later uh but uh this was a uh this was one that that gave me pause andres i'll be honest because i was gently surprised by the fact that it wasn't another uh it wasn't another manhattan project hbo special where like you know everything was fil filmed about like you know the manufacturing and the capabilities of America coming into the nuclear age with a uh, uh, a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, when you're going through, and uh, additionally, too, we have to remember that uh, though he has done things masterfully in this subject matter, uh, no one has been able to take care of a few autobiographical titles, uh, Dunkirk being a very popular one. But it isn't the kind of, uh, it isn't the majority of his uh, capabilities. Usually he's doing things that have to deal with, you know, a psychological point of view, uh, uh, a uh, an action or a thriller kind of situation where we see in Tenet and in the Batman movies. Mind job. Mind job, yeah, exactly. So the first kind of thing that I want to open up when we start discussing this movie first is, did it feel like an autobiography to you? And were you surprised at all by the specific points of this man's life that no one wanted to focus on uh, when you were watching this film? Did anything come up as a uh, surprise for you? Well, yeah, because I, I haven't really studied the subject. I mm. just you know, normal history studies. Yeah, we, we're not claiming to be specialists. To yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I am not a particle physicist. Yeah, 100%. I, I am not a, a mechanical engineer. Yeah. I am not any of these um, really, really um, educated people. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> as, as far as my knowledge about you know, the atomic bomb and and uh, the creators of um, such such a device. Mm -hmm. It just goes back to World War II and Pearl Harbor and uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and all of those things. I appreciate so, where you're coming from. Um, yeah. So so th it, it was it was definitely an education. I've seen a bunch of movies about the subject as well. Yeah, so it's it, hard. It's, it's hard to be an American and not and uh, a fan of film and not delve into the subject sure, matter. You know, sure. So I mean, I'm I'm kind of familiar with the idea behind everything. There were a couple key points that uh, Nolan visited in this um, 
in this project that mm-hmm. I really wasn't savvy on or, or well informed on. Yeah, me too. Uh, but I also really liked the the different kind of storylines that that we're reviewing. It felt like I got six movies in one. Yeah, I can respect that. So, so I actually really do like that because if if it was a linear movie, it might be on the boring side of it as yeah. far as well, okay, we kind of know what happens. Yeah. You know, there's no big surprise that the bomb was created. There's no big surprise that the bomb was used. How much of a cha- how much of a challenge <laughs> challenge do you think that is when like you already know the ending how do you make it interesting you know um well it's just a way of choosing how to tell your story yeah because it's a story that obviously is relevant that people want to hear and see and watch yeah it's not however many projects have come before this one yeah I'm sure there'll be more after um but i i was definitely um not disappointed in any side of the filmmaking uh, for what this project was. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. I can respect specifically too that uh, we do have uh, the recurring uh, relationship uh, with um, uh, Nolan and Murphy uh, coming up through here. Uh, Murphy has done a really great job. He played uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer and uh, definitely an Oscar-worthy performance. He's definitely been getting some nods in regards to that already. And we will, I think we'll see his name coming up on the podium at least with the uh, next Academy Awards uh, specifically because of uh, you're making faces, uh, but no, no. I, I was just gonna say I love the recurring relationships that happen with between 100%. filmmakers and actors, and and how they utilize them to their advantage and yeah. stuff like that. So I, I I'm really happy about that. Yeah, but uh, and you know what? You're allowed to be unhappy if you want. I mean, that's completely fine, man. Uh, I'm happy about it. You can you can tell me, Andrews. It's all right. You I'm disappointed. You disappointed that I'm not part of this cast. <laughs> That's the truth. I feel that. Uh, but let's let, let's dive into the cast because not only do we have uh, Mr. C. Murphy, but we also have uh, Robert Downey Jr., who played um, uh, Senator uh, Louis Strauss, uh, who uh, popped up here uh, with additional uh, Oscar nods already. And despite that, let's just talk about the cast in general. Uh, th- this is the first time... Uh, well, do you have your checkbook out? Because... There's oh my some gosh! Pretty hefty paychecks going. On. I mean, good lord! We're talking Emily Blunt, uh, Alden Einreich, Scott Grimes, Kurt Kohler, Tony Goldwyn, Kenneth Branagh, Ted King, Tim Decay, uh, and uh, I mean Florence Pugh. Uh-huh, oh thank my you god! Very much. Uh, just thank unbelievable. Uh, Josh Hartnett, Alex Wolf, Josh Zuckerman is in this movie. Uh, I haven't seen him in uh, anything in a minute, but I am so very happy that he was able to uh, just pop in here. Uh, either, uh, actor, writer, director, no, mostly for uh, things like <laughs> Austin Powers and like Sex Drive and stuff like that. Actually playing a serious part uh, in a autobiography movie, a Nolan film, just, just made me so very happy to see him back up here. I remember seeing him from like things I saw on uh God, years ago. Uh, but uh, I think that when we go about and we do see here this great chemistry, you can absolutely speak to why Nolan continues with uh, the same kind of actors uh, going about and playing the roles that come into play. Uh, when it comes to, if you need somebody who can do something like psychological and still like helm the ship, for lack of a better term, Murphy's a great choice. If you need somebody who's tough and can offer great support, Emily Blunt is can not only take the responsibility of the uh, of the spotlight as she's proven before and playing numerous parts but also offer uh, great support uh, when it comes to uh, providing points of the story uh, Florence Pugh broke my heart in this movie uh, I thought that the way in which she was able to uh, uh, really just push forth and uh, give us a an idea of a mental illness that uh, her uh, that Jean Tatlock uh, was dealing with as being a woman who uh, was a communist back in the 19. 19- uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and fell in love with a man uh, who wouldn't love her back. And uh, later we find out that she, uh oh. Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! Yeah, uh, before we go any further in regards to that, uh, 
if you guys haven't seen Oppenheimer, then uh, by all means, watch it before you watch it, uh, listen to this podcast because we're going to spoil anything. And also a trigger warning uh, in regards to self-harm and suicide. Uh, Florence Pugh's character, her, well, I can't say character because this woman was, well, you can say character because of her interpretation, but Jean Tatlock uh, did commit suicide. Uh, because she was dealing with conspiracy, uh, conspiracy. Because and there, there are <laughs> conspiracy. It is suicide in quotes, and I'm not. I don't want to give any fuel to like anything, conspiracy. but conspiracy. Uh, it is a well-known point. We need of, a conspiracy alert. <laughs> you're right. It is a well-known point of history that uh, Jean Tatlock may or may not have ended her life by choice uh, because of what she knew and her um, uh, relation to the Communist Party and also her relationship to Oppenheimer himself, uh, but. The way in which her character was played, the way in which Florence Pugh, I think, uh, despite despite the, I, I think Pugh actually was maybe my favorite performance here, even though Murphy did an amazing job. I think the man does deserve an Oscar for his portrayal of Oppenheimer. Uh, Pugh has this, such a human way of being able to provide what uh, we see when it comes to somebody who is dealing with depression possible schizophrenia, uh, mental illness in a time where that kind of thing just was pushed aside even more so than it is now, which it is. But uh, people didn't even have an idea of what, you know, depression really was back in the day. It was just somebody who may have been in a bad mood and need to get a few more, uh, a few more uh, old fashions down their gullet so they could calm down or something like that. But mentalities change. And this movie is about that. It is about change. Uh, over the uh, course of the first act, we see Oppenheimer uh, going about and being able to see in his mind's eye, the way the world really works. Uh, no, uh, kind of like leaning a bit more on the romantic a bit, but understanding the truth that matter in of itself is just stardust. We're made of atoms, we're made of molecules, and they're moving at certain frequencies. And the way in which young Oppenheimer wanted to go into take care of that uh, meant that he had to find the people who were going to be willing to train him and then make his own discoveries in regards to what he thought the universe was. It did, of course, you know, mean that Oppenheimer was a bit of a jerk. Uh, he wasn't a good man. Uh, he was a very smart man. And we see points of this in the first act where we look at him and see that he is dreadfully curious and trying to figure out the answers to the universe and also uh, possibly killing his professor by putting arsenic in a... Uh, or not arsenic, but um, cyanide. Attempted murder. Attempted murder by putting a uh, cyanide uh, into conspiracy. An, <laughs> an apple that uh, his professor was going to chomp down on, but he was able to you know save him before time. Uh, the first act is really about how Oppenheimer is being able to find out his truths. Uh, he's trying to figure out as to where he lives in the world, uh, where he. Uh, uh, where where his part is in it, and also his need to uh, his his need to find a point of peace when grappling with what he believes to be the truth. Uh, at this point, uh, in the um, uh, er, uh, late thirties, uh, early forties, uh, things were happening in physics. Uh, we had uh, Einstein's uh, theory of relativity that changed the world, and Oppenheimer was able to build off of that. And through his own studies and through the uh, capabilities that he had, was ultimately uh, able to find uh, his own way of being able to artificially uh, uh, combine uh, technology to make a form of fission. Uh, that ended up not only creating uh, a, a weapon of mass destruction that was used uh, against the forces in Japan in World War II, but changed the idea of energy, energy constructs, and energy consumption for America and for the rest of the world from that point forward. A lot of historians say that this was the beginning of a new age, you know, the Bronze Age, the Golden Age, that kind of situation. This was the beginning of the nuclear age for not only America, but for the human race. Uh, when it comes to the way in which the first act introduces things, Andrus, and we see that Oppenheimer is manifesting this, almost this, this madness, I think, about finding the truth, he all, ultimately, Nolan does, I think, and Murphy even more so, does a, uh, an incredible job of showing us that he's not a hero, right? He's just, he's a, a very focused individual. Was this kind of like a, a a culture shock somewhat? Were you expecting Oppenheimer to come in and be, I'm a man of science and I'm going to protect my country, so on and so forth. But we find out that no, that no he's actually a narcissist who's ca who's capable of terrible I mean, things. He's a womanizer. He's all these things. What, what were the things running through your mind when we were being introduced to this character? Well, of course he's all those things. He's a genius. <laughs> like, How dare you? Any, anybody that, that has that special you know, like IQ boost. Yeah. Typically doesn't follow the social norms of anything. Yeah, that's true. 
So there, there were so many scenes in here where I'm just like shocked, but not surprised at the at the the circumstance that he finds himself in. Do any do any pop um, out uh, for you in particular but that are happening in the beginning of the film? At the beginning of the film, well, I mean, yeah, the the, the poison apple. The poison apple is kind of a giveaway, special. right? <laughs> I think it's pretty special. I mean, that's a that's a nice way to be defiant yeah. when you're in college and you know how to murder people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but the the surprising thing is how suspenseful it was when he went to collect the apple. Yeah. Rather than the fact that he had poisoned the apple. Yeah, I respect that. So for, for, for me, there's that scenario. Um, not so early on, but later on, the, the fact that he gave his child to his friends mm -hmm. like, because he couldn't deal with it and his wife couldn't deal with uh, caretaking. Yeah. Um, I, I, I found that to be a good solution to his problem without... It's a logical solution. Handing yeah. an apple to his child. Yeah, 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 hundred <laughs> percent. You know, rather, so, rather mean, than kill the baby. Things, yeah, there were definitely things about um, the way he problem solves, mm -hmm. <laughs> and hey, everybody's got their own way. And if you happen to problem solve while you're womanizing or um, doing important speeches about unionizing, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, faculty members and stuff like why, why not? I think the first act does a really good job of being able to provide us the reasons as to why Oppenheimer is who he is, and I think that immediately we jump into these uh, points of photography that I would like to talk about a little bit because we yeah. had these artificial slow motion uh, uh, points that come in that were simple techniques, uh, but uh, well. They, simple in the way in which they were produced, but not in the way in which they were constructed because you're dealing with like a I don't know, $500,000 camera that has a capability of being able to focus in on, uh, you know, raindrops and, and that kind of thing and give like these slow motion shots of uh, these artificial uh, nuclear explosions, which we find, uh, you know, if you were to uh, go through and find out like these were all um, uh, the, the, the sunspot shots that, that pop up that no one was able to put into uh, the first act, giving us an idea of Oppenheimer figuring out for himself you know, really leaning into the idea that, you know, we're made of atoms and that kind of thing was interesting. When we're getting introduced into like, you know, it, it takes it out of the third person, which is what this what this movie usually falls under because we're seeing these these things pop up as an observer of what Oppenheimer was doing. But what were your feelings like? Did you like the idea of like how Nolan changed perspective uh, when it came to this? Or was it like more of just a... a you no, know, if you were to call out any of the pieces that, that were distracting yeah. or or I, I guess moments where it takes you out of of the story it is those it's yeah. going down to the molecular level and seeing seeing perhaps through through Oppenheimer's eyes um that that didn't really do it for me although it's fun and it's educational and it does do its job that's true or for, for cluing us in because like if we have no concept for how small an atom is and how atoms work without the explanation that he gives in, in one of his um, flirtatious uh, <laughs> uh, encounters. <laughs> we need to, we need to, we need to find a group of people who think it's hot to do podcasts about movies and then we can just like, you sure, know, just sure. be given, given a, uh, you know, a free license to, uh, to do whatever we want. So you want to go on a date and yeah. let's talk about things? <laughs> anyway, yeah. I mean, he was definitely using it as as um, a, a way to flirt, a way to communicate, and a way to educate. And yeah. So so many different things from what that scene was, but with an explanation like that, some people would understand it. But visually, you tell that story so much more quickly. That's true. And effectively and efficiently, but. For me, it did take me out. I think it, if if its placement could have been in different areas and whatever, that might that might work better for me. But I I don't know where I would do that. I understand. I mean, these guys are masters of what they do, and it, it was effective. But it did take me out. I, I feel like the other thing that did take me out too, and I'm sure that we'll talk about that is 
um the black and white to the color the different the yeah. different variations of yeah. filmmaking that we saw i think that uh jumping into that it did a really good job of being able to co- course around his life and then when stress levels came about or we had these interesting pieces where he was doing uh flashbacks and it was giving uh points of how oppenheimer's genius was in its own way maybe a, a form of um uh, at least in, in my interpretation, uh, just a form of stress or a form of mental illness in and of itself. Because we do okay. these really lovely points where Murphy has these great ways of being able to emote just enough when it comes to... Oppenheimer wasn't a, you know, a flashy guy. He was given you know, instructions to you know, keep wearing his fedora and his hat around uh, you know, uh, the Manhattan Project around New Mexico so, and not a uniform so that he uh, would be able to... You know, have freedom in that way but the well, way also to to maintain his scientific Indeed. persona rather than a military even though he did uh, receive a rank when they were doing authority yeah, yeah when they were doing the project yeah. but uh i think that to your point these actors do uh so much with so little there there are scenes here where we see murphy going about and just putting his hands over his face and you can see uh, these, through these big close-ups and through these switches over to a pallor of uh, just black and white that lead us to see, um, just to like build up off of your point, a very quick, succinct way of showing us how stressed this man really is. And this movie goes about and focuses on that stress. It focuses on his life. Quite honestly, his capability of being able to manage people and orchestrate the detonation and uh, the construction of the nuclear uh, weaponry in America is probably the most exciting chapter that happens towards the uh, the very end of Act Two, uh, maybe uh, beginning of Act Three, somewhere around there. It doesn't even happen at the beginning of the movie, which which was interesting to me. It is the biggest and loudest chapter, but it isn't the most detailed. Uh, we understand specifically when it comes to Oppenheimer how he was just a uh, non observant uh, Jewish man. He was born in New York. Uh, he uh, went about and uh, when he graduated and he went to college in Europe and studied at Christ College in Cambridge, but later on uh, was able to find uh, a lot of uh, work outside of the Cavendish Laboratory and moved over to find people who were dealing with um, actual theoretical physics, cutting of the edge science uh, back at the uh, University of Göttingen uh, in Germany. Uh, I'm sorry, not in Germany. Pardon me. Uh, he was uh, he left Cambridge for the University of Göttingen and to study under Max Born. And Göttingen uh, was one of the world's leading uh, centers for theoretical physics at the time. And this is where he was able to uh, go about and uh, start developing his own uh, theories to the point uh, that he got enough of a repertoire uh, that he was given a teaching job at the United States National Research Council uh, at the uh, uh, with, with, a, with a fellowship uh, to the California Institute of Technology. Uh, uh, back in uh, 1927. And this was, I think, a subject matter of so many films, uh, American films at least, because this was the first time that science had been able to peel away the veil of the mysteries of the universe, quite honestly. Um, we're talking about like, you know, people being able to find out laws about gravity, electricity, magnetism, uh, the fact that the earth is round, uh, orbital stations, uh, the universe in and of itself. And now we have the capability of being able to find ways in which the energy that makes the universe what it is, how it works. And Nolan in a uh, good Nolan fashion, uh, does his usual thing when it comes to these montages that pop up. Uh, no one is a master of the montage. In fact, I think he's changed the montage so that it has it is used in a way that not only uh, it doesn't fulfill the traditional way in which a montage needs to be used, which are these quick cuts to make succinct points of action and glue two points of time together uh, in under five minutes. He stretches them out. The second act, all the way up to uh, when we are dealing with them actually being able to finalize and get to the detonation of the first uh, nuclear bomb in America. Uh, is nothing but montages that go back and forth uh, in time. Uh, we see things popping up in regards to how he's able to meet compatriots at the California Institute of Technology and the National Research Council. Uh, and then we see it go back to when his baby was born. Uh, we see it going into how uh, he and Einstein had had uh, a brief communications and how he's under the 
strict impression that war is coming and that he needs to do something and uh, provide uh, information about what's going on. And then it goes back to, again, him having uh, previous scenes with uh, dinner parties where he was able to meet Florence Pugh's character and, uh, you know, seduce her with his capable physics brain, uh, which, I mean, goodness gracious, if Florence Pugh uh, likes people who enjoy physics, then I need to go back to college. Uh, it'll be worth it. But when we're dealing with this situation that's popping up, though, it's still disjointed. I think, though, that instead of... Other than Batman, I think this is probably the most succinct storytelling that we've seen in Nolan from a traditional sense, where we have a beginning, middle, and an end. But it's still like a Nolan beginning, middle, and end. And it has to be that way because it's from a historical figure. Did you find the second act when, like, you know, he's doing this. He's doing these extended montage things where he's going back and forth, like a disturbing kind of situation? Or did that kick you out of it like the, uh, you know, the, the, the magnification of Adams or something when we got into Oppenheimer's mind and so forth? What, what were your feelings about that as that was... Because the momentum is going up to, like, the climax of the film, and then it goes down and deals with some very interesting materials that we'll talk about in regards to the third act. What were, what were your feelings in regards to it? Because no one does jump, but not as much as we would expect no one to jump in this movie. I think it's specifically because it has to reflect history. Well, and he's also confined to a timeline, um, like you said. So yeah. um, I'm not sure how to answer that one. I, I think that uh, words, words, <laughs> words. I, were, I I think. What were your What were your feelings about how the timeline was was, was processed in the movie? Like the the, I mean, the series got, of events. I got a little bit lost in it. So I did. I, I definitely did. I mean, some some of the the uh, the tools that he used for storytelling, such as the black and white, informed me as far as where we are in time. Yeah. But at the, there there is a difference also in the aging process of how they presented um talent as far as uh in, yeah. in what what time or what year we're, we're living in mm -hmm. but but it also really didn't matter that much because there Why was not? enough there was enough educational content in there that kept me thinking and processing like the intellectual like yeah. side of it yeah 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 kept me engaged so, like, if I needed to play catch up in any part, I could do so. Yeah, and it, and it really didn't matter. Um, I I did get confused with the the romantic. Um, yeah, lines the Florence Pugh slash Emily Blunt timelines. I yeah. didn't know what was going on. Um, well, he was cheating on his but, wife but for it, sure. It, it also I mean... added to the effect that he's a womanizer, and it yeah. really didn't matter. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. All of it really did inform me, but as far as do I have a strong opinion of it, I was I was really just engaged all the way through, with the exception of those those flashes into the into the molecules. Like, which is which is good because I mean, again, one of the reasons as to why I like Nolan's films is because I do get surprised and I have to wrap my head around it. I had to watch Tenet three times before I was able to put the timeline together. I had to watch together, Tenet a lot, of times. you know. <laughs> and yeah. I I do I was expecting to even though it is an autobiographical piece, uh, I was expecting to you know, do those mental gymnastics a little bit. And I, I found that to be a bit on the light side, which I appreciated from Nolan. And I can understand as to why that happens because like yeah. you, like you mentioned strict timeline, we know these events happened. We know they happened in this order, but how do you make that interesting? We just can't have the second act be Oppenheimer arguing with a scientist and then cutting over to him having a mint and julep every five minutes or whatever. Well, you know? He's always been a really creative director in the yeah. sense of what he captures and how he uh, ends up with the edit. Yeah. So I'm not sure how hands on he is as an editor or if he just gives his editor instructions and says do yeah. something magical with it, like yeah. everything else that I've done. But Memento for me was like mind blowing. Yeah, 100 percent. Inception was the same thing. Yeah. Interstellar was the same thing. Yeah. So as far as as far as using an edit to help tell your story, I think that there's mad genius going on there. If you look at the Batman franchises, it's it's just pretty standard. Yeah, it's pretty linear. A to B to C as yeah. far as the linear storyline. But, but that's a subject matter um, that has to go through for sure. But I was, you're absolutely right, I think. Yeah, but but for me, like, it, it really didn't... It, 
I got a little bit confused, but it didn't take me out all of the way. Yeah. I just, I kind of went along with the ride and said, okay, well, they're going to explain it. Yeah. And they did. I feel that. I think so. that, I think that when we are coming up into the, uh, the half of the second act that's coming up, uh, we know that things have to start ramping up forward because we are taking into consideration the kind of work that Oppenheimer was doing when he well, started also teaching. The timeline. Yeah, hundred percent. A pressing timeline as part of that storyline. That's so. a great point to talk about. So we find out that when Oppenheimer was uh, doing his work uh, in the 1920s and into the 30s. Uh, at the United States National Research Council, uh, he was able to do work. Uh, he did important research with theoretical astronomy, uh, reading from the wiki, uh, general relativity, nuclear physics, uh, spectroscopy, uh, quantum field theory, quantum electro electrodynamics, and uh, he was able to uh, you know, turn formal mathematics into a more relative situation. He found a different way in which he could apply these old terms to, uh, to kind of tackle these brand new uh, kind of uh, ideas. And then we see through uh, the second act going into the ramping up to the third act uh, and uh, past the climax of them being able to make the atom bomb and make it successful, Matt Damon comes in, uh, who is doing a great job uh, with his general... Um, Gosh, I can't remember what the name of his character is. Let me look at the IMDb here real quick because he's actually uh, he's actually towards the end of the list here. Uh, General Leslie Groves, uh, who was able to see that Oppenheimer, through his publishing, was able to about to go about and uh, have some good information about what's going on. And of course, Matt Damon comes in and he says, "Hey, we think something's going to happen." And then there is this whole situation that we all know of, if you are an you know, American who has taught general history, that uh, there was a big belief that uh, the Nazis at that time uh, were on their way towards making a weapon of some sort, and it made America uh, and the, um, the, the American uh, military industrial complex and also like you know American media and everything very nervous. It was found later through history that this was untrue and that they were that the Americans and their nuclear program was uh, years ahead, but they didn't know that at the time. And I love this dynamic that we have between Matt Damon and uh, between Murphy because there is this brilliant way in which Murphy quietly ends up being the straight man in this quote-unquote historic comedy duo kind of thing. We have Matt Damon pouring nothing but passion and anger out of Leslie Groves. Uh, there's a great line that says, you know, uh, he, he's in there and uh, one of the scientists can't make it on time or something along those lines. I'm paraphrasing because it's been a minute since I saw the film. But he says, this is the most important part, uh, point of American history or something like that. To know and Matt Damon does this really great job of just playing angry guys <laughs> who are still... Uh, quite competent and able to be uh, brought these ideas. And I, I really love the ramp up of this film, Robert. I love it how we uh, were, he, where Nolan used this montage formula to carry it into the third act where we see, we think the Germans are doing something. We need your help. Uh, well, here's a revolutionary idea. Get every scientist that we can, put it in one place, their families, their churches, the, their bars. We have to do this. We have to make this happen. And it's one of these situations that you can see it's happening with Murphy's performance where Oppenheimer and the scientists that are coming out through here and also the military in the background. And we'll get into the political kind of stuff that pops up in regards to this too because Robert Downey Jr.'s character did a great job of being able to fuel the fire here for his own interests and then play it off as if it was for the interests of the American people. But the way in which we have like this uh, elongated kind of stretched out montage stuff popping up with these different events coming through it really gives me the idea through Murphy's uh, performance that they're trying to push forth the, method, the, the message that Oppenheimer, on top of having a baby, on top of having to deal with genius, on top of, of having some, uh, some, some dealings with the Communist Party, which during this time in American history was a big no-no and still is in some uh, circles, uh, that he was thinking so much about the fact that he could that he never gave a thought to if he should. And that doesn't come until the end of the movie when we find out that Oppenheimer is being charged with being a communist and uh, going about and, uh, and being anti-nuclear uh, and, and seeing, saying that the uh, bombings on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki may have been unnecessary. He got lost in the capabilities of his own genius. He was able to prove that uh, through this work that he and his organization set up that they were able to tear the universe apart with their bare hands, he never thought for a second that 
if he should have. And by the time that, you know, they were willing to pull the trigger, uh, it was too late. Did, did the, did the ramp up kind of help you out? Did this say things to you about Oppenheimer's well, character or, or was it? I'm not it... sure I agree Okay, with cool. Yeah. Tell that. me, tell me. In, in the, in the sense that I feel like we got that comment from Albert Einstein earlier on. Yeah. It's just like, what are you doing? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like you can't unopen Pandora's box. I can't remember what he said, but it was something like, um, this is a terrifying yeah. scenario, whatever it was. Well, later, later, like, I, I feel like that maybe he didn't pay attention to that or right. it didn't, it didn't really affect him in the way that it did. Mm-hmm. And maybe he had to build the bomb in order to prove to himself. Prove him to himself. Maybe. Yeah. There's the a lot of ego. Possible scenario. Uh, Albert, uh, Albert Einstein played by the uh, uh, capable Tom Conti, by the way. So good, yeah. by the way. Yeah. So great. He was a great Albert Einstein. Um, yeah, but there was just <laughs> there was a lot about the cautionary tale of yeah. what, what what the circumstances could be. Well, the it, famous the famous Oppenheimer quote, right? Like, I am Shiva, God of Death, and and he that you can go on YouTube and look. But now that Oppenheimer's ideas towards the end of his life was that this may have been a mistake, and that it, it did open up a Pandora's box, and that things may have only gotten worse from when they started. Yeah, I mean, like. Yeah. Okay. Moving on from that, because that's going to be like a whole like soapbox diatribe. I got you. I got you. But as far as far as um, the the court, the the trial. Yeah. uh, Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. um, It's not even a trial. It's uh, not a trial at all. Let's let's go and jump into that. Well, uh, the third act. What's the name of it? I can't think of the name of it. I can't either at the moment. I'll look it up. uh, If I can find it, uh, we'll see what's popping up in regards to it. But uh, to your point, uh, you're right. The uh, the the second act we have a climax of his of his secrets of his secret yeah of his uh, of his clearance yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, jumping in and seeing how this movie is focused on. The lot the the third act um, is really the third act is really just a an encapsulation of the American government's uh, uh, bigotry, quite honestly, at the time, and also the way in which they uh, were one hundred percent against like you know socialist values and that kind of situation. Because I mean, admittedly, uh, you know, this was uh, you know the heyday for uh, the American Empire. And capitalism and, and pushing through even more so than it is now. Well, maybe not, but I think that when we're dealing with the way in which these lawyers and these trials were pushing against Oppenheimer because they thought that he was a communist, they were just trying to ruin him so that he would shut up about, like, you know, saying things like, hey, maybe we should slow down when it comes to nuclear armaments, where we had people who were coming up that were higher ups in the American government that were saying, no, no, all gas, no brakes. We need to go through, and that uh, that um, mentality uh, won out in the end uh, because now we have you know so many nuclear missiles that are capable of you know mass destruction all over the world and that kind of situation. Uh, it was this interesting kind of point of, I think, when it came to hearings that were put up that were specifically intended to eliminate Oppenheimer's political influence, it really gave us an even deeper, more intimate look into uh, the character and Murphy was able to handle that. What I was wondering specifically is if it was going to extend the film so that it was uh, more of a, of a political kind of court drama instead of like the scientific kind of man versus nature situation. And, and it was, but it was still about the man. It was still like mostly through Murphy's eyes. And at, at that point, it was it was Robert De Niro's character, Robert De Niro Jr.'s character versus Murphy's character because we, we know at this time, uh, historically speaking, and it is up to interpretation, but Louis Strauss wanted to, um, wanted to uh, end Oppenheimer through the use of the security hearing. And he was doing so with influence with the people who are going to make the decisions as to whether or not Oppenheimer was going to get his clearance back. Meaning specifically if Oppenheimer was guilty of treason or not. And it wouldn't have been like official treason, but it would have been treason that uh, would have ended his career, ruined his life, that kind of situation. I mean, he's a smarmy character. He's a smarmy guy. What were your feelings when you're watching this unfold? 
Like I loved Robert Downey. Jr. Absol absolutely. I was, like, I was just like eating it up. It absolutely. Was, it, was, it was delicious. Yeah. Um, there, there's just so many like incredible things about that whole storyline for me because it got under my skin. So absolutely. Just the hypocrisy, man, that, that so extreme as far as how I felt about, uh, not, not only, not only Strauss, but, um, Jason Clark's character. Oh, absolutely. Well. Yeah. 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 Punch in the face 20 times. He does such a great job um, of playing with was, just the smarmy. I love Jason yeah, Clark so his much. Name was Roger Rob. Yeah. Uh, but, but I also hate those kind of confrontations. So like it, it yeah. was right up my alley for like, feeling the anxiety that you know being put in oppenheimer's shoes well that's the that's the point of the scene sit through all of this garbage being thrown at you so i love the i love the uh, setting up of the scene too where that's where we really dive into the black and white that, that's popping up and yeah. it's just these these tight angles and you see the power structure here especially when the camera shot is taken over with the council looking down at this long table and the small man of oppenheimer and he oh. has like it's 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 put that way in, uh, in a reason you know it's it's, it's definitely like these... yeah they talk they talk about setting up the room in that specific way to make him feel smaller oh. and claustrophobic and all of that so it's great uh, I, it is definitely, mind a, job. it is a mind job. Uh, but luckily, uh, well, I mean, it depends on who you're rooting for. Um, and honestly, when it comes to heavily politically based films like this, uh, you really can't take sides in my opinion. Uh, you can definitely be an observer of history and say, take the side of, you know what, that's interesting. Uh, but I mean, for every argument that you have that, uh, Robert Oppenheimer was a hero, there are equally, uh, logical arguments sure. that, that he was, a uh, you know, uh, a, a creator I'm a sympathizer for, you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. And, uh, and also the instrument of mass genocide. Yeah. 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 But I think that's one reason why I like the movie because it gives this artistic bent on dealing with multiple complicated, heavy subjects all at once. We usually have like episodes that are coming through. Uh, well, our episodes are only like an hour long because, you know, that's what we want to do. We want to make it like, you know, easily like digestible for people. We don't have like, you know, want to have like a full diatribe. But we've talked about uh, different movies during these episodes where it's like, you know what? And you, and you did it today and I've done it too. I need to pump the brakes a little bit because if we go on to this subject that was uh, populated because of the subject of the movie, we're going to be talking for three hours and we're both going to get on our soapboxes and do that. That happens with me with Nolan films more so lately than almost any other production that I've seen. And that's like dis disregarding like, you know, uh, older movies that were dealing with uh, heavy, heavy, heavy subjects. But recently this is a conversation starter. This movie has uh, kind of made history exhilarating um, in regards to like being able to talk to you about this. I, you know, was definitely, you know, dusting off old history books and that kind of thing, looking up wiki articles and all that stuff. And it's because this movie incentivized me to be educated in some way, you know, internet educated <laughs> about the subject matter. Is that important for autobiography autobiographies to do? Is it yeah, especially if you can't trust your researchers? You can't, uh, you can't make the movie because yeah. every but that the history buffs out there that know the truth behind these stories they're gonna attack yeah they're gonna say you got it wrong they're gonna they're gonna throw tomatoes at you what kind of from a from a production standpoint what kind of challenge do you think challenges people have to deal with because they still have to put they still have to put butts in the seats but you're dealing with like you mentioned before when we were first starting you're dealing with a story whose ending we already know well it's it's a big story for one yeah that's true. Right? Is it is it a story about life and death? Absolutely. Yeah. Is it a story about love and loss? Yes, it is. Is it a story about this and that and whatever? Yes, it is. <laughs> it's about it, it gets it's all so five. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> so I mean, so as as long as your story points make sense and you can find a through line to connect all of the dots in the way that you want to connect them, great. But if you get the details wrong, yeah. And you call him Poppenheimer? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you call the other end Strudel? Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I yeah, mean? yeah, yeah. I feel you. It's, I feel you. It's not going to be an effective movie. It's but it has to. Not. It has to come from an unbiased place, though, too, right? Because if no one was not necessarily, it, it can definitely yeah. come from a biased place. Sure. I mean, choose a perspective and tell your story. Why not? I get that, but like when you're dealing as with far things, as the research needs to be accurate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
that's hundred percent, a hundred percent true. But I, I, I'm thinking of it as being a, a situation where the, the point of an autobiography being entertaining, uh, and to your point, because the research has to be true and everything, absolutely. Uh, it has to also be educational. That's something that other movies don't have to deal with specifically. And if we were going to have a situation here where Nolan was a hardcore socialist, then it would be a different movie, but he's not. And I think he did a really good job of being able to provide us the just the history and let us make our own decisions in regards to whether or not it was entertaining or not. But that's, it has to be challenging, isn't it? I mean, it has to be a situation where you have to be honorable to the pardon me, because I don't find it boring, but, you know, to the boring subject matter, because it has to be factual, but still make it entertaining. How do yeah. you do that? Well, I mean, we're talking about blowing things up. We're talking about <laughs> Athens. It's exciting That's true. Already. That's true. I we're guess talking maybe... about having affairs. Yeah. We're talking about spy stuff, you espionage. Know? We're talking about wartime. We're yeah. We're talking about so many epic There's so many layers, dude. You're absolutely right. That, that, I mean, choose one or choose all of them and tell that story. And no one just decided to choose all of them. Yeah, yeah. I um, respect that. But, 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 I mean, even if you split this movie in half yeah. and just tell the, the uh, atomic bomb and the love story, you still have an interesting, engaging, educational um autobiography it does its job yeah you're right even even if you just tell the the strauss and oppenheimer storyline it's still educational and interesting and effective in its storytelling yeah so so for me it comes down to storytelling itself i feel you yeah 100 percent. if you're gonna choose an autobiographical story to tell you need to decide how autobiographical it's going to be absolutely absolutely and then decide which direction you want to take it because i mean if this is based on a true story well it can be the story of you know robbie and rob and rob <laughs> sure, 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 you know sure. for, for the story of <laughs> of uh robbie the adam the adam splitter yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah right um and, and then just tell whatever story that is but <clears throat> there has to be the edu or the uh the historical components that need to be accurate to tell an autobiographical right. story. Otherwise, you're just telling based on an idea that's yeah. truthful and then just fictionalize everything. Let's go into uh, specialities. Then, because... I mean, I, I picture him with Thor's hammer just like <laughs> smashing an atom and then boom, there you go. You know what I mean? It's I do know what you mean. Uh -huh, I'm picking uh, up where you're putting down. Silly things come to mind when when I go off topic. But... I know you're, you're right on topic and I appreciate your opinion in regards to it. Uh, but we are getting close to the episode uh, uh, ending over here and I want to jump into... Uh, whenever we're dealing with like huge, huge yeah, productions, oh, I gotta ask you, dude. Wow. I gotta yeah. ask you. Uh, let's talk about specialities in that regards too, because this is a mammoth undertaking. This cast alone, uh, location uh, was you know in Europe and also in America, that kind of thing. So from that perspective, not the most challenging title that we've talked about uh, in Pull Focus, but man, you, I'm sure I'd be surprised by uh, some of the um, uh, different kind of challenges that come up. Uh, with it, uh, different challenges that come up with it. Uh, when, when it comes to the cast, I'm going to ask you, like you know, the the sacred question: Is this the same movie uh, if it has a different cast, or is it the cast that's really pushing this in certain ways? I mean, Murphy and D Robert Downey Jr.'s uh, dynamic here, I think, was interesting. Like, I I cannot see this movie played by any other people nice. other than who played the role. I just there's, that's rare there's gonna, I, be, I, I, there's gonna be very few circumstances yeah. where i would say that but i mean you you get this amazing cameo by gary oldman oh yeah man um you get i mean just just go down the list of characters yeah, like, on Affleck, yeah. as soon as he started talking absolutely because i finally watched manchester by the sea and yeah, oh my, my god was, my oh gosh. my gosh! Let's not even talk about that. You're gonna break um, your heart and. But five, as soon five. as his voice came on, that's yeah, the only, that's the only thing that I would say with star power that drives me a little bit bonkers. Okay, is if they have such a distinctive voice and you're trying to pinpoint the voice before the reveal of their face comes on screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It yeah. does take you out of it just a little bit. Just a little bit. I, yeah. mean, I made the connection very quickly because of the proximity in, in which I watched the two right. movies, but. 
there, there's just all of these things. Um, he just stares daggers at him, man. We, he just, we did crazy. the casting for Hereditary. Alex Wolf was the lead in that movie. And yeah. He was in this. And I saw his face and I didn't recognize him because he's so much older. Yeah, than yeah, he, yeah. Um, just a few years. There was a lot of change that happened there. Um, the, there's a project that I'm working on that some of these other characters are working on. That we can't talk about right now, which I love very much. It's kind of cool to see their <laughs> their names and stuff mixed in with that 100 um, josh hartnett i think oh god i loved seeing him in this so role so stinking good and i'm so glad that he's back yeah on, me too on kind of the mainstream he, he's he's because, doing he's doing great he's he's he, doing really he looks great, great and, and really he's proud of all of that i'm yeah. so very yeah i'm happy to see him in more than just like teenage rom-coms now you know he's, he's a serious actor he can handle this stuff i love it well and i'm glad for that yeah you know I mean, not that not the teenage rom coms are bad. I mean, I watch them, but 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 there's also relevance to, you know, he went through a hard couple of years based on post Pearl Harbor, and now here he is doing another World War II movie. Sure, a little a little (laughs) typecast, but I mean, you know, just kind of you know, uh, take take a big breath before you accept this role. (laughs) Hundred percent. But you know, I mean, Emily Blunt, I'm a huge fan. Um, Florence. And like epic fan, hundred percent. She's so good at what she does. Um, I just I don't know that I could say there was a misstep in the casting. Ooh, okay. So okay. I mean, I Dane DeHaan just yeah. shut up. I mean, he was so <laughs> he was so smarmy. He's so good at those so good roles. At those roles. I'm such a fan of his. It's so amazing. Um, like there's just an arrogant turd quality. <laughs> <laughs> he plays so incredibly well. I love the Jack Wade. I, I'm just gonna keep going. I'm go just gonna it. say names. I'm like all of them are so good. They're also good. I will never and get Matthew Modine. <laughs> I will never get tired of Kenneth Brenna with a uh, mustache and uh, talking uh, science in a German accent or whatever accent it was that he's pushing it, through. He, this it was he amazing. Could literally, like seriously, yeah. any, anything, anywhere, anything, anywhere. I think that when we're dealing with uh, sound, I was surprised a lot with this movie. And that made me very happy. It made me very yeah. happy. Um, not necessarily like first of all, I thought the visuals, like when we were doing the close up on like you know the explosion of the nuclear bomb uh, popping up, was was great. But it's it's earthquake filler. You know, you have like some low rumble popping around, and you have like these weird uh, spasms of of synth that pop up here and there, and some really good foley. But where I was surprised was the connection of the sound to the action at the beginning of the movie. You hear this boom, 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 and uh, later on you realize it's the sound of the of the people uh, uh, at the uh, institute stomping. that stomping their feet in the stadium, where Oppenheimer makes his announcement that we were successful, uh, yeah. we were able to bomb the Japanese, and during the test too, my cat's kill, my cat's yelling at me. Um, during the test too. Uh, there was this really interesting point at the test too. There was really this interesting point uh, where we see Oppenheimer watching the explosion and give me one moment. (laughs) Okay. 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 Yeah. There you have to now go up there and shut up. It's okay. Go up. Come here. I'm angry at you, but I'm not angry at you. It's okay. There. All right. That'll be easy to edit out. <clears throat> the one, the, the, there was a scene that surprised me the most that I really enjoyed the most, too, where uh, we see the expanding explosion uh, coming about in slow motion, which is on all the trailers for Oppenheimer. It was like kind of what sold this film a little bit. And instead of taking the opportunity, of making it be like this really huge Foley swell kind of thing, or maybe like a musical thing, which we know Nolan is great with. You know, we talked about the brown uh, with, with the Inception. With track. Inception. All we hear during the scene is Oppenheimer's heartbeat and his breathing. Yeah, and I thought that was such an interesting choice because we are seeing it through his eyes in the most at the most intimate time, this is the apex of his life. This is proving to himself that he was right. And at that point in his life in the movie, that's more important than his 
kids. That's more important than his wife. That's more important than anything. And to have like this silence where we see uh, the bomb popping up at the test facility and all we hear is his breathing and his nervousness and his, ah, man, I I just thought it was this really intimate portrayal of how the character and and how uh, we would (laughs) deal with that kind of situation. It was was a very interesting choice and I really loved it. And like my my next favorite sound effect coming up was like when finally the uh, the sound wave hit and everybody gets blasted in the face for a, for a brief minute, um, and it was in the desert, so they handled the it's sa- a windstorm. It's a windstorm, <laughs> but they handled they handled the the sand fully really well. So you know I, I geek out about stuff like that. But the boom, yeah, but it was it was a bomb, and there was no explosion sound you know it was just it's interesting uh and it was dynamic and it was dramatic and i loved it uh but that being said uh maybe you didn't uh maybe you didn't love uh, the movie maybe you did uh we don't know uh but if you happen to have any opinion about that uh by all means uh let us know uh go ahead and uh you know like and subscribe on youtube follow us on soundcloud uh go ahead and uh show us throw us an email uh pullfocuspod at gmail.com uh just you know remember whatever your opinion is we may be wrong, but it's your job to tell us. Andrus, as always, it's, uh, you know, we're going to call it a night. Uh, it has been uh, an interesting conversation as always, and I can't wait till we have our next one. Uh, please <laughs> be good to yourself and stop working be so hard. Good to yourself. You guys, you guys can't see it because it's a visual podcast, but uh, Robert and I are both rocking uh, some razor sharp mustaches right now. We we look like people uh, from the 1940s who <laughs> were <laughs> throwing down uh, with Oppenheimer. Uh, but uh, as always, Andrews, thank you so very much, and I look forward to talking to you again, my friend. Thank you, back guys. And for all of you, thank you very much for taking your time to listen to us, and. Uh, Uh, We will see you on the next one. Take care of yourselves. Bye.